Thank you all for being here today. My name is Whitney Horton, and I am an account manager um, in the classified, classified and local group here at Google. And I'm really excited to be here today to have my friend and new author friend, Paul Hudson. Um, Paul and I grew up together in Atlanta, and we also went to the University of Virginia together, traveled together in Europe, and I'm actually excited because I made the book, my name. And we have been good friends in New York City for about six years now. Not only is Paul an author, he's an avid traveler, a musician, and works at the Park Hill Group, which is a subsidiary, I knew I was going to stumble on this word, uh, a subsidiary of Blackstone Group, um, and an all-around great guy. His travel memoir was never about making any money. It was involved six years of writing, and I can attest to this because I saw his book, the book he was going to publish, I think six or seven years ago, sitting on his bedside table, and we all kind of chuckled, but he made it a reality. So just a little bit about the book, and then I'm going to turn it over to Paul. Um, BarnesandNoble.com said, On the surface, Prelude to Tomorrow is a travel memoir, a reflection upon, upon Paul's trips around the world during summer breaks from college. But he quickly reveals a deeper focus, not just on America, Africa, and Europe, but on friendship, youth, and the search for one's identity and path in life. I'm happy to welcome Paul Hudson. Well, thank you very much, Whitney. And uh, thank you very much to Google and for Office of Google for having me. I'm honored to be here, very excited to be here. You know, when I, when I first published this book, as you can imagine, I had a couple book release parties to celebrate, one down in Atlanta, Georgia, where I'm from, and one up here in New York at a friend's apartment down in Soho. And Whitney was there, as well as Chrissy Del Tato, who is on video in Mountain View. And at the end of the night, they both came up to me very excited, and they said, Paul, we're very excited about what you're doing. We love the concept of this book, and we'll let you know that we have this thing called Authors at Google, where we invite people to come speak about their books. We, we think that Google will love your book and what, you're, what it's all about, and we're going to put it up for consideration. And I was very honored by, by that, and uh, my initial reaction was, you know, this, that's great they're going to put it up for it, but there's no way that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get the chance to come speak because, you know, you know I'm not a known, well known author. This is my first book. Uh, as, as Whitney mentioned, you know, I think I, I self-published this book. I, I'm, you know, I'm not a famous author, so why, why would they pick for me to come talk to Google? And then I didn't think much about it, and a few months later, I got a very excited email from Whitney and Chrissy saying, congratulations, you've already been through the approval process, and you're approved, you're, you're invited to come speak to Google. And it, it blew me away, and I'm still blown away to be here today. And it made me take a step back and think, you know, what is it about my book that caused both Whitney and Chrissy and then the authors of the Google program to say, this is perfect for Google. You know, this matches with Google, and we'd love to have you come speak. So I started to think, you know, what, you know, what defines Google? What do I think of when I think of Google? And um, you know, first I think of I think of creativity, and I think of a company and people that are all about free thinking and and no boundaries to what is possible. I think about a company that appreciates its employees and um, their interests outside of work. I think that Google understands that, you know, that work is work, but that there's more to life outside of the office. And I think that, therefore, it attracts very dynamic people, people that have multiple interests in life, multiple goals in their life. And so I did, decided to do a little research, actually, on Google.com about the company. And I don't know if you're aware, but you have a culture section. And I want to read you a quick quote from the Google.com culture section. It says, there's little in the way of corporate hierarchy, and everyone wears several hats. In fact, the international webmaster who creates Google's holiday logos once spent a week translating the entire site into Korean. And the chief operations engineer is also a licensed neurosurgeon. It goes on to say, when not at work, Googlers pursue interests from cross-country cycling to wine tasting, from flying to Frisbee. And I thought that really highlights the fact that, one, Google does attract people that have multiple interests, multiple goals in life, and two, that it does encourage and attract people um, you know, that, that are trying to get the most out of life and, and there's more to life than, than just work. So I think I'm here for a couple of reasons. I think first I'm here because I'm not, I, I don't fit the, the mold of a writer. You know, I'm self-published, this is my first work. I had to have an idea uh, to share my story and, and to pursue it on my own. And uh, you know, for me, this is the, writing in, in this book, it's an entirely new attempt and effort for me. And I think that Google appreciates that. Uh, second, I think that I also 
consider myself a dynamic person and have multiple goals in life, and Whitney hit on some of them, but uh, you know, it's not good to admit this these days, but I do have a job in finance. Uh, I work at the Park Hill Group, which is part of the Blackstone Group, helping to raise money for investment funds. So by day, I have this career in finance. But then away from that, um, I'm also a musician. Music's a huge part of my life. I've, I've been playing in bands all of my life, I, uh, high school in Atlanta and college at Virginia. I play in bands up here in New York. I've actually had a couple different bands with different friends. And even this Saturday night, I'm performing um, at a place called the National Underground, uh, doing an acoustic show. It's just on Housen and Allen from 7 to 10. If anyone wants to come check out some music, I encourage you to come by. Uh, so I've got the day job of you know, finance, also a musician, and then clearly I have a, a passion and interest for, for traveling and for writing. Uh, and away from who I am as a person, I think that my book and my story captures the Google message of the importance of learning. And I was thinking about it, you know, why do you go to Google.com? And you know, I go to Google to hunt a thousand times a day. I think everyone here goes to Google.com a thousand times a day. And it's because you need to learn something. You have a question and you need an answer. And I think traveling, you know, that's the essence of traveling. You, you go out into the world to explore and to learn. And you have a question. It may be a question about yourself, maybe a question about a place, or maybe a question about life, but you go out into the world and you travel and you explore and you learn. And I think that that very much matches with, with, with Google. And so the three main topics that I wanted to cover here today, uh, the first is what is this book about? The second is why did I write the book? The third is what did I learn? So what, did I, what is this book about? Why did I write the book? And what did I learn? And I'm going to weave in a few excerpts from the book along the way, but for the most part, I'm just going to talk about my experience and, and what I've learned. So first, what is this book about? I think the title of any book should give you a sense for the story. So if you take my title, it's Prelude to Tomorrow, a collection of travel stories. And I think, to me, there's a double meaning in the title. I think there's a meaning for you, the audience, the reader. I also think there's a meaning for myself uh, as the author. And I want to share a quick side story because this is not the first title that I came up with. Um, I remember when I, I, I just finished the book, I was talking to my parents and I was talking to my mom. And I said, Mom, I think I've got the title down. She's, she's very eager to hear it. I said, well, well, what's the title? I said, how about the 12 months of freedom? And she started dying laughing. And she said, Paul, it sounds like you just escaped from jail and you're, you're, you're out in society. It's your first year back. Uh, I, I think I understand what you're trying to say, but you might want to think about a separate title. And I bring it up because I did want to explain what I meant by that initial idea. I mean, to me, the 12 months of freedom were the same as my four months of uh, college summers. Because the majority of these travel experiences were done throughout my, my college summers. In the first summer, I drove across the country uh, with friends from high school to Colorado and Utah and New Mexico and back. And then later that summer, I took a trip with my family, a very uh, special trip to to, to Kenya in Africa. And then the second summer, I was working on a cattle ranch in Montana as a, a ranch hand. And then the third summer, I was st studying abroad in Innsbruck, Austria, and wrote about living in Innsbruck when Whitney was on the trip and, uh, and traveling all around Europe. And then the fourth summer, I was writing about uh, living and traveling in, I was living in Lake Tahoe and traveling all around California. And so to me, I wanted to capture the importance of these, you know, college summers, because that's, that's the first time in your life when you're, you're away from your home, you're outside of your parents' abode, you're out there, it's your first time to really do the things that, that you want to do. And of course, um, you know, I, I just want to encourage everyone that when you have time in those summers to get out there and travel, and of course, everyone's got, you got to work and you got to get your work experience and your internships, but when you have those breaks, and if you have time in your hands, I really wanted to send the message of how important it is to travel and what I've learned from that travel. Um, so for me, you know, this book is really about two primary themes. One, the first is travel. The second is self-discovery. And to me, you know, what is travel? It's anything that's new, and it can, it can be done anywhere. And I wanted to read a, the first excerpt from the book that I think captures the theme um, of the book. Departing home is perhaps the single most important aspect of growing up. How can you claim to know the world if, in fact, you've never seen it? Whether you move to a new city for a few years, attend college in a different part of the country, or simply get in your car and begin taking trips, it is crucial to meet new people and see new places. You need to take steps to view the world's broader scope. Many people often forget that the mere act of being born in a city does not necessarily preclude other cities from having redeeming qualities. Our trip across the country enlightened me. 
Atlanta's skyline has new meaning now that I have walked in the plains of Kansas. Georgia's smoky mountains evoke new perspective when I compare them to the Rockies. I'll say it again, everyone should drive across the country with friends. I can't contemplate a regret that such a trip could create. You need to see a thousand different cities before you begin to understand even one of them. The world has its patterns and its mechanisms. You need to travel to discover the links in the chain. So I thought that, that highlights, you know, you need to get out of your comfort zone and get out into the world and travel. And, you know, for me, even after University of Virginia, I moved back to Atlanta, back home, and I quickly started realizing that I was, I was back in my comfort zone. I was, I was doing the routines of life that I, that I knew growing up, but there's so much more out there that I wanted to explore. And it's one of the main reasons why I moved to New York was because there's so much in this city that you can explore every day. I think, you know, as you know, you can live here for months, years, or your whole life, and you are constantly finding new things to do, whether it's at night or on the weekends. You know, there's, there's just so much to do in the city. And I often um, almost consider myself still traveling, living in New York, just because there's so much to do. Um, the second point I wanted to hit on was why did I write this book? And there are, of course, a number of reasons. And the first, as I mentioned already, was to, to really share my story and encourage others to get out there and to explore the world. And I, I wrote this book while I was in college. You know, I decided to write this book um, in the third year of my college, in April of 02. And I was witnessing everyone around me, and I felt like everyone was, was so caught up in the need to get an internship every single summer, work all summer to get that experience so they could get that job three years down the road when they graduated from school, which of course is important. But I thought that that everyone was missing part of the point, which is that you have these summer experiences where when you have the time, it's so important to get out there and travel the world. Because I think it's very important when you're young, especially, to get out and travel. You're without responsibility of your full life ahead of you, and it really can mold you much more. And you can, um, you, you know, you, you can learn so much more when you're young. I think our, our, our culture, our society as a whole, is so focused on the goal of retirement. You know, we're going to work, we're going to make money, we're going to work as much as we can until we can make enough money to then relax, then retire, then travel, then take those times to do those creative pursuits. But to me, the concept of traveling when you're older, it's likely different. You may have kids, you may have a career, you may have a profession, you, you know, your, your thoughts and your ideas and your patterns, they're already developed. And so I think it's important to always travel in your life, but when you're older, it's different than when you're younger. And so I think that when you have the chance, when you're young, I, I just really encourage those to get out there and travel. And one of the reasons I wrote the book was to encourage um, not just anyone, but especially those that were younger than me, those that were in high school still, or those that were in early parts of college, to get out there and explore, because I just think it's such a crucial time. Uh, also, I wanted to, to, to capture my mindset in youth. And you know, I think that a lot of people write books, they decide to write a book about what they've learned after they retire. And, and I wanted to write a book about what I've learned kind of before I start, you know, with my whole life ahead of me. And I wanted to capture that, that youthful mindset so I could look back later and think about the things that I wrote when I was young. Because I think there, a lot of people write about experiences that they did when they were young, but you don't always write about them when you're young. And so you don't, you don't always capture that mindset. And I really wanted to, to try to capture that here. The second thing that I wanted to do with this book, and away from encouraging those to travel, was to encourage others to, to consider the creative pursuits such as writing a book. Um, I wanted to prove to everyone that just because you're not typecast into a, um, you know, if you're not a writer, or you're not an artist, or you're not a musician, you can still go out there and you can still be creative. You know, here I am, I studied finance in school. I'm working for the Park Hill Group, you know, the financial career in New York, but I'm someone that's written a book. And I wanted to show that, you know, I think a lot of people write off of these ideas. A lot of people have ideas to write something, whether it's a, an article or, or a book, or they want to record music, or they want to make a painting, but they say, I'm not an artist, or I'm not a musician, I'm not a writer. Um, you know, that's not, that's not who I am. I can't do that. And I wanted to prove that, yeah, you can. You know, if you get out there, you can, you can write a book. Um, and I, I'm just an example of, of someone that's done that and wanted to, wanted to really push that. And I wanted to highlight an excerpt, and again, from the book on this concept. Uh, I guess I wanted to use parts of the book to actually have the message inside the book about encouraging uh, creative pursuits. And so there's a part of the book where we're living in Lake Tahoe, and it's, it's the summer of 02, right after the, the tech bubble had burst. And we're hiking up this trail. We met a couple of guys who had just uh, lost their job because they were in tech venture capital in Silicon Valley. And we were talking to them about their experience. And I wanted to, uh, to read an excerpt about the, um, our conversation that we had that day on the trail. Being laid off doesn't sound so bad, Bates said to Hunter and me. Not when you live in Cali, said Hunter. That internet thing sure messed up a lot of jobs, I said. I know, said Hunter. Everyone out here is out of a job, it seems. 
The tech bubble is like a damn revolution, said Bates. Think we'll read about it one day, asked Hunter, like in the history books? The industrial revolution, the tech revolution, I wonder what's next. We need another renaissance, I said. I bet that was cool to live through. Yeah, said Bates, all the talk these days is money, money, money. We need a creative revolution. Think how cool that would be, I said. All the talk would be music, art, film. After giving it some thought, I added, wouldn't it be cool if everyone was required to take a year off after college to do something creative? Like what, asked Hunter. I don't know, I said, like, make a film, write a book, record music, just anything out of the ordinary. Now you're talking, said Bates. So not only is the book itself um, an example of, you know, someone that goes out there and has an idea and sees it through, but I actually use the book and the, and the message within the book to encourage others to do so as well. And then the, uh, you know, another reason for writing this book is it allowed me to combine a lot of my passions and a lot of my pursuits into one project. Uh, I clearly have a passion for traveling, and I was able to write about it. Um, but as I mentioned, I have a, a passion for music. You know, I'm probably one of the world's biggest fans of music. And I, I, I used the book, and I dedicated part of the book to writing about music and my thoughts about music. And part of the, uh, the travels when I was in Colorado was I spent a week at the Telluride Bluegrass Festival. I don't know if anyone here has been, but if, if you're a music fan, I really encourage you to go. It's every June out in Telluride, and it's a gorgeous setting, and the music is always you know, incredible. And so I used the part of the book to write about that, uh, that festival and the musicians, and then also my thoughts about music and what it means to me. And so I want to read another quick excerpt that I wrote about, uh, about music while I was out there. Think about the service that musicians know how to provide. Oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, yeah, that's right. Think about the service that musicians know how to, uh, how to provide. It is quite valuable. Musicians take entire rooms full of people away from their worries and into pleasant states of mind. Thousands of stressed people, people stressed about work, people stressed about relationships, people stressed about life, all walk into a performance from separate directions. In an instant, people unite. Stress disappears and hidden smiles emerge. Good moods are created out of thin air. When all is said and done, the people in the crowd walk back to their cars, changed, happy. Everyone simply feels a little better than they did only hours before. Music can refresh an unlimited number of people simultaneously. To me, that is simply incredible. So I mean, one, of the, one of the goals for the book, away from writing about travel, was to write about my other passions, which were you know, music and friendship and, and, and others. And um, you know, another thing I wanted to do with the book is to share stories about the places that I've been to away from my story. One of my inspirations for, uh, as a travel writer is a writer named Bill Bryson, who wrote books such as A Walk in the Woods about his travels up the Appalachian Trail and uh, In a Sunburnt Country, where he explored all around Australia. And one of the things I learned from Bill Bryson is that, you know, your story is only so important. You know, you going to these places and your thoughts about these places, it can only capture the reader's attention so much. You've got to tie in side stories to keep everyone engaged. You've got to talk about the histories of places that you've been, uh, people that you've met, people that used to live there. And I'm not, I'm not talking about the history like you would read in a history book, but things that really were fascinating. So I put a lot of research into the book and places that I went, and I read a lot of history. And I tried to only pull out the facts that I thought were really... Um, really fascinating to use in the book to talk and, and to, to add to the stories about the places that I've been to. So I want to read an example about when I was um, in Lake Tahoe and, and some of the historical facts that I, that, that I uncovered about Tahoe that I thought were, were, were quite interesting. Let's go ahead and get this out of the way. Lake Tahoe is quite a large lake, 23 miles long and 13 miles wide, which is, of course, much bigger than the island of Manhattan, with a surface area of 195 square miles. Two-thirds of the lake is in California, one-third is in Nevada. Lake Tahoe is the second deepest lake in the world. Happy yet? Not me. You still don't understand how big this thing is. The lake is as long as the English Channel is wide, and its width is half that of the San Francisco Bay. To give you a hint, Lake Tahoe holds enough water to cover the state of Texas to a depth of eight and a half inches, the state of Texas. It can cover California with 14 inches. Take Lake Mead, for example. Lake Mead is backed up 227 miles into the Grand Canyon by the Hoover Dam. Lake Mead is considered one of the largest man-made lakes in the world. Tahoe contains nearly four times the maximum capacity of Lake Mead. That's a lot of water. The Panama Canal averages 700 feet in width and 50 feet in depth, and such a canal can be filled by Tahoe's water and extended completely around the Earth at the equator with enough water remaining to fill another channel from San Francisco to New York. Lake Tahoe is quite the large lake. So those are the types of facts that I was trying to uncover uh, and tie into my story along the way. Um, 
Okay, so what, you know, away from why I wrote the book and what the book's about, I think the most important topic I wanted to hit on today is what did I learn? And there are a couple things I wanted to mention. The first is what did I learn about travel through these experiences? The second is what did I learn about myself? And the third is what did I learn about writing? So what did I learn about travel? The most important thing I learned about travel is that your perspective is always changing. And I wrote in the book that it's important to see a town in both the light as well as the shade. And I think it's important to see a town or a place in different, uh, in different ways. It's important to see it during the day. It's important to see it during the night. It's important to see it in different times of year. Um, you know, an example of that, when I was living in Innsbruck, Austria, one of our hobbies was to go up. We were at the Alps. It sits right at the base of the Alps. And one of our hobbies was to go up and explore the mountain. And on the sunny days, it had a certain feel. And Whitney was hiking up there with me. It, it's just this glorious feel. It, it's bright and blue. You look down upon the town of Innsbruck, and it just feels like this bustling city that's alive. But then there's other days where we went up on the mountain, and it was, it was a little cloudy. And it was dark, and it was gloomy. And you look down upon the city, and kinda, it looks kind of mellow. And uh, it feels like a, like a wintry place. And, and, and your thoughts about these places change based on when you see them. And I think it's important to see places in um, as many, in many different tones as possible. Um, you know, example of New York, think about both the winter and the summer. You know, in the winter, think about that first snow. You're, you may be sitting in your apartment, you're sitting in your office, and you notice that the first snow is coming down, and it's just beautiful. And then as it starts to accumulate, you're so excited that you've had your, your first snow. But then what happens? A couple days later, the, it gets a little warmer, and the snow starts to melt. And then a couple, you know, the city turns to a mess. And it's, you're so mad that it snowed because it's, it, it, it's so gross outside, and all the sidewalks are, are, are full of mud. I think about the summer. I mean, after spending uh, you know, five, six months of being freezing in New York, everyone is praying for that first big, hot spring or summer day, or everyone's outside walking down, down the street and having coffee and relaxing because it's finally hot again. But then what happens? A couple weeks later, it gets hotter and hotter, and it's the middle of summer, and all you want to do is go outside or you get away from the heat. And so I think it's just important to see places in different, uh, in different tones, in different times of year, and in different environments. And another thing I wanted to mention is that I learned that it's important to see a town, even approach a town or place from as many different directions as possible. An example of this, um, when, we were, when I was in Italy, uh, before I went to Innsbruck that summer, traveling around Europe, I was with my family on the coast of Italy in the, the Cinque Terre, which is it's five towns connected by footpaths, and you can hike to all five towns. And we were in the town of Monte Rosso, and we decided to hike to the town of Vernazza. And so we were hiking through, it was a gorgeous hike up, up through these vineyards, and you kind of, you round the corner, you, you're high up on this cliff, and your first view of Vernazza is from this cliff looking down. And I remember being taken back by this view and saying, wow, you know, you can approach this town by, by hike, by car by train, by sea, but I think that hiking here has got to be the best way to see this town. It's got to be the best way to approach it. But then I, little did I know that six weeks later I was going to be back because everyone on our trip to Innsbruck wanted to go to the Cinque Terre to celebrate the end of our summer. So we're in Monte Rosa and I'm hanging out with some friends and someone said, hey, why don't we go check out Vernazza? And I said, I know how to get there. There's a hike. It's gorgeous. It's the only way to approach Vernazza. And someone said, well, why don't we take a boat? And so we found out that you could rent a boat. And it, when I say boat, you know, a 15-foot wooden boat with a motor that you have to steer. And so four of us got in this boat in the Mediterranean and, and boated our way from Montrose to Vernazza. And I remember approaching Vernazza from, by sea, saying, wow, I thought hiking was the way to get here. Boat is definitely the way to get here. Uh, you know, it, it, it's a sea town. It's, we're in the Mediterranean, and, and basically the mountains kind of crash into the sea, and, it, and this town is sitting right at the base of it. And it's really a sea town. So I, I, I realized later on that, you know, in my opinion, it's a better way to approach Vernazza by sea than by hike. And think about, um, you think about New York again. I know everyone can relate when you, you've flown into LaGuardia, you've flown into JFK, and you're on the BQE, and you have that first big stretch where you can see the city. And, um, you know, it's just a, it's a vast city. And my first thought's always, wow, you know, the energy, the power of, of New York. And, um, but I, there's, there's times in my life where I've approached the city from other directions. You know, one of my hobbies is biking and cycling and getting outside the city and, and biking. And one of the places I like to go is in the Palisades, which is across from the George Washington Bridge. And there's been times where I've been biking uh, back into the city, biking across the George Washington Bridge, where you can see the city, but you feel like you're on your bike, biking back home. And, and yeah, it, it's, always, it's always cool to bike back in the city and, and to see the city from the bridge, but you know, on your bike approaching the city versus being on a car from the other side of the city, seeing that, that landscape, it's just a different experience. And you have different thoughts, and, and you can learn things from from uh, seeing places from different directions and seeing them in different tones. 
So that's one of the things I learned about traveling is that your perspective is always changing. Um, you know, although it sounds obvious, I think one of the things about traveling is that you're always experiencing something new. You're experiencing a different way of life, a different way of doing things, and that's new in itself. And uh, I wanted to read another quick excerpt about my first experience with riding in a, a bush plane when I was in, in Africa. There's a big difference between dozing off in a jet 30,000 feet above the ground and zipping across the plains low enough to spot wildlife. A good difference. In a jet, you feel slightly sheltered as you pass through the clouds and look out over the vast haze covering the earth. In a bush plane, you feel alive. The engine roars loudly as you putter through the air. The thin doors of the plane shut but rattle. Conversation isn't possible. Words are sucked directly into the propellers. You are forced to listen only with your eyes as they sweep across the landscape. When you look down, the view appears less like a picture on television and more like the opening scene of an IMAX film. The earth moves beneath the plane like the ocean rushing past your feet in the wake of a sandy shore. One second you are gliding. The next your stomach is sitting in a roller coaster. Turbulence in a bush plane feels more like a ship riding out the pummeling waves of a deep Atlantic storm and less like a minor speed bump in a smoothly paved neighborhood. Safe and secure are the last feelings to surround you. You lose the relaxing daydreams. You are forced into exhilarating reality. The wind is right next to you, not outside. For once, you actually feel like you are flying. And so for those of you that have never been in a bush plane, I can probably relate it to you know, riding on a motorcycle versus being in a car. When you're in your car, you feel safe. You know, you're obviously moving, moving down the street, but you don't feel like you're right in, you know, in the wind moving. But if you're on a motorcycle, if you're on your bike going fast, you, know, you can feel the wind right next to you. You feel like you're actually, you know, I can feel myself moving 20 miles an hour as opposed to being in your car. And that's sort of the similar feeling to what you get in riding in a bush plane in Africa versus being in a you know, jet 30,000 feet above the ground. Um, so those are some of the things that I learned about travel. The next things I wanted to hit were, you know, what did I learn about myself? And the first thing I learned, and it may sound funny saying this, but I learned that I like writing. And you may say, what do you mean? You're a writer. You're talking to us today about the book you wrote. What do you mean you learned to write writing? Well, I didn't know, to be honest. I, uh, you know, in high school and in college, I hated writing those papers. And even in college, I, I avoided taking a lot of English class. I, you know, I, was, I, was, I was taking finance classes. And um, I, I knew that I had an idea for this book, but I wasn't sure if I was going to like it. But I, I found out quickly that, that I did, and I definitely do have a passion for it, and I love it. And one of the first ways that I knew that I liked writing was when I had ideas for things that I wanted to tell, some stories. I, you know, I was sitting at home thinking, well, maybe this story will take a couple hours to write, or maybe it might take a couple days to write. But then it would be weeks later, a month later, I'm writing this story because I had so many details that I wanted to share, which was a huge sign to me, well, maybe I like writing because there's a lot that I want to, that I want to share. Um, the second thing which is related is that I learned that I like reflection. And one of the things about writing, I think a lot of people glorify the concept of writing, but the truth is it's, pretty, it's a pretty lonely activity. You know, it requires sitting alone either at your desk or at home or in your office, wherever you choose to write. But if you're going to write a book, I mean, you, there are, there's a lot of time that's going to be spent on your own uh, where you're thinking and you're, you're reflecting. And um, some people might not like that. You know, some people would rather be out socializing with their friends or out playing a sport or out just doing something as opposed to spending all that time sitting at home reflecting. But I learned that I like it. You know, personally, I, I enjoy that downtime. I, I enjoy time to reflect, and I, I enjoy time to write and to think. And it's something that not everyone would probably appreciate, but I, I learned through the experience that I, that I do like it. Another thing that I learned is that I, uh, I actually learned this again, because my parents told me this over and over when I was growing up, is that I have a one-track mind. You know, I was growing up, I had all these ideas, that I would, that I, uh, things that I wanted to do, or, or, and um, you know, I wouldn't give up on them until they happened. And my parents always said, you know, there's Paul again with this one-track mind. But I relearned that I do have this one-track mind because I had to have the dedication and the passion to see this project through. You know, it could have been possible that I had an idea for this book and I started writing for a month and then I got a new idea and I put this down and I, I started something else. But I, I kept with it. And, um, you know, one of the things I wanted to mention is that, and I'll say it again, I, there's so much time that had to be put into this book in order, in order to get it through. And when I first started writing it, I kept it, you know, secretive. I, I told my parents, but I, I didn't tell the world. I didn't tell a lot of my friends because I didn't want everyone to constantly be asking me, how's it going? When's it coming out? Because I knew that it was going to take forever. So I tried to keep it a, a personal project. But then there was a problem. Um, you know, some of my friends started to, to notice that I was spending a lot of time on my own. You know, there were a couple trips that I declined to go on. And I, I said, I'm just going to, you know, hang out at home for the weekend. Yeah, thanks. Y'all have fun. Or, or Saturday afternoon, my friends are going playing golf and it's a great day outside. And I'm saying, no, I'm just going to hang out at home. So one of my friends, a guy, Chad Smith Gall, who's one of, the, one of the main characters in this book, 
I started noticing that we were, we were losing touch a little bit. You know, we, I didn't know as much what was going on in his life. He didn't know what was going on with me. He, and one day he approached me and said, Paul, you know, what's going on? Is everything okay? I'm worried about you. Are, are, you, de- are you depressed? And I, I said, wow, this is a real problem. I've got to, I've got to tell him what's going on because people are starting to think that something's up. So I said, Chaz, this may sound crazy, but I've been writing a book. And he was so elated. You could see his face light up. He was like, I'm very excited to hear that because I was getting worried about you. We haven't seen you in a while. Um, but I just wanted to highlight that you know, so much time goes into writing a book that it's, it's, not, it's not, definitely not an easy task. Um, so that gets me to my last main, main point, which is what did I learn about writing? The first thing I learned is that you're, you're, never, you're never done and it can always get better, which is unfortunate because you write something. It may be a sentence or a paragraph or a section. You think, oh, this is great. Um, but then you go back and realize that it, you know, it can definitely get better and there's a lot of editing involved. And someone once told me to try to write such that every sentence is good. And when you have that level of criticism of yourself and of your writing, you really can always go back and keep editing. And, and I would say that probably half of the time I spent writing this book was writing the first draft. And then a couple years were spent re-write, redrafting, rewriting, re-editing. And that takes a lot of time. And, and when your goal is to make every single sentence good, um, you know, it's important. But it, you learn that, it, that it's always... It always can be better. I, mean, I could still be editing this book today, but at some point you've got you've to you've complete it. But there's a lot of time, not just in the writing, but in the editing and, and to improving it. Second thing I learned about writing, which is related, and I learned this from my English teacher, because after I'd written the book, I, um, I asked my English teacher from high school to read a section of the book. It was the section on Africa, to get her thoughts on both that section, but also just my writing style, and, and to hear her thoughts about how I could apply um, her feedback and criticism across the book. So we're sitting there at lunch, and she says, Paul, I want to share some advice with you that Ernest Hemingway is famous for. She said, it may sound crazy, and it'll sound crazy to you. Ernest Hemingway once said, you've got to learn how to kill your babies. And I said, what do you mean you have to kill my babies? She said, think about it. When you write something, you think of it like it's a part of yourself, and you become very attached to it. You think, this is my thought. You know, this is true. This, I'm, I wrote it. Like, this is my baby. I don't want to change it. This is, the, this is what I wrote. But you have to learn to go back and kill your babies, because sometimes those sentences may not work, or sometimes the paragraph may not work. And the hardest thing you have to do is to go back and kill entire sections. There were a couple times in my editing process where I had to go back and hit the delete button on 20 pages of writing, something I'd spent months working on, because it, it didn't work anymore. Either, either the writing was poor, or it didn't tell the right story, or it, it just wasn't needed anymore. And so you have to go back and learn how to, how to kill your babies and hit that delete button, which is very hard to do. Um, the third thing I learned, similar to what I've mentioned before, you know, writing, it's not living, but it's, uh, it's thinking. But in order to write, you can't just write about the things that you're thinking about. You, you've got to write about your experience. And um, an example I'll give, you, you know, I decided to write this book in April of 02, right, right before I went out on my last summer to Lake Tahoe. And I thought, what a great place to write this book. I'll be in Tahoe. I'll be in California. I've got all, you know, all this time on my hands. Why don't I write the book in, in, in California? So I, that was my plan. The first day I got there, you know, I was in the cabin, and I, um, I pulled up my computer, and I started writing. And I started thinking about it. What am I doing? I'm sitting inside trying to write. Well, I just got to California. There's so much to do. And my goal is to sit here and write all summer? That's, that's crazy. You know, I'm supposed to be writing about my experience, not about uh, just my, my thoughts while being here. So I actually closed the computer, never opened it up again that summer, and I went out there and I explored California. You know, I, I drove around the state, I went hiking and cycling and fishing, and I generated all of this experience that I, that I later used to um, reflect on and to write. And so you learn as a writer that there's a time and a place for writing. And, and sometimes it's, it's the time to write, sometimes it's not the time to write, it's, it's the time to go out and do things. And so I, I learned that in California especially, that was the time where I needed to go out there and do and be active and generate the experience later to write on. So the time that I actually wrote a lot of this book was when I was back from my travels, living in Atlanta or living in New York, uh, while I was you know, working. So either late at night, if I didn't have much going on, I would decide to, to open the computer and write. Or maybe it was a weekend, or maybe it was a vacation, I would decide to write. But those are the times to write. You know, when, it's, when it's cold out in New York, it's the middle of February, and you've got nothing else to do, why not write? But when it's the summer and you're in California, you know, that's not the time to write. You should get out there and explore. Um, so the last main thing that I learned about writing, uh, and I'm still learning this every day, is how hard it is to get published. You know, this is my first book, and I, I didn't know anything about the publishing process and how it works. And the first thing you learn about getting published is that you need to have an agent. 
And the first thing you learn about getting an agent is that you need to send out what they call a query letter, which is basically like a one-page summary of your book that you send out to the agents to try to get their interest. And I thought, this is great. I'm in New York. Actually, the majority of these agents are in New York. Uh, you know, I've, I've seen their office so as I walk down the street. I actually know where they are. Why don't I send all these letters, and it'll be, it'll be wonderful. In a couple of weeks, I'll have coffee with the agents, talk about my book, and I'll have dinners and lunches, and I'll have all these great you know, meetings with these agents. And then the first, one of the things they promise you is part of their job, they promise you they will get back to you. It's part of their job, they will respond. So a couple of weeks later, I got in the first letter back. I was very excited and said, you know, dear Paul, we're very sorry to tell you that, you know, thank you for your submission, but we have no interest in your book. I said, oh, that's just, that's just one letter. You know, I've got 30 more letters out there. They're all right down the street. They're going to want to meet me next week. Every single letter that I got back, all 30, were a form letter saying, Dear Paul, thank you for your submission. We have no interest in working with you. Because one of the things I learned is that agents, you know, they get paid based upon the success of one of their writers getting published. And they take on projects for free, and they, they work hard trying to get one of the um, a publishing deal. And if a deal gets published, they'll take a stake on it. But they're not going to, it's almost impossible to get picked up by an agent if you're a new writer because. There's so many people out there like you, and there's so many other writers that have written you know, 2, 10, you know, 15 books that are trying to get published as well. Why not take on someone else that already has uh, a backlog of experience? And so you know, one of the things I learned, and everyone tells you, but you learn it you know, firsthand when you, when you write, is that there are so many people out there trying to write a book, and it's so hard to get published. I mean, someone told me once, it's, it, you know, it's so, getting published is similar to going pro in a sport. I mean, it's possible, but it's... It's very, very, very difficult. And um, you know, one of the hard facts you have to face when you write a book is that you know, everyone that writes a book thinks, this is going to be great. Everyone's going to love it. It's got so much stuff that the world's just going to love this book. But one of the hard things you have to realize is that it's not true. Some people are going to like your book, but it, it may not appeal to that many people. And the, the likelihood is that it's, it's not going get, to uh, get published for the most part. But the last thing I want to hit on is that if you, if you do move forward with your project, whether it's a book or whether it's recording music or whether it's art or anything, if you have this creative idea and you see it through, the thing that I have learned is that things will just start to happen. Things you would never imagine would start to happen. And a couple examples I wanted to highlight. Uh, after I wrote this book, I made a friend um, with a guy named Dave Bill. He's a, a teacher in Worcester, Massachusetts. And he yeah, heard about my book and he said, you know what, I think that my students would love this book. I'm going to put your book on their summer reading list. So I actually had a number of students in Worcester Academy read my book over the summer on the summer reading list, which blew me away because, as I mentioned, one of my goals was to get this book in the hands of younger people that were in high school or younger in their life, that had their lives ahead of them, that could go out there and encourage them to go out there and travel. And here I had these students that were reading as part of the summer reading list, which I just never even thought about. And then the second thing that happened with Dave is one of his goals is to introduce technology into uh, education. And so he had me do a web talk from my apartment in New York. I had, I had to buy a, a, a webcam, set it up in my apartment in New York, and he gave a talk about this book, similar to this, to their classroom in Worcester Academy, which I did a few months ago. And the experience, it, it, it really was overwhelming for me, because here I was giving a talk to the, the ideal audience for this book. I mean, there were students in the class that had read my book, and you know, they're about to all graduate and, get, and head off into the world. And I, here I was giving a talk to them, the, the ideal audience for this book. And I just never even thought that something like that would happen. Uh, another really cool thing that happened, sort of out of the blue, was um, there's a reporter for the New York Daily News that was doing an article about authors um, in New York. And they called my, the publishing group I use, which is iUniverse, it's part of the Barnes & Noble group, or it's an affiliate, and they called iUniverse and said, hey, we're writing an article about authors in New York, do you have anyone that's recently published? And so they looked in their database and they pulled up my name and said, yeah, this guy Paul just wrote a book, he lives in New York. And uh, so I got a call from the New York Daily News saying, hey, we're writing an article about, about authors. Would you like to be included? I said, of course. And I, I thought all along that it was, an, it was an article about people that had self-published. And they said, that we we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna highlight a couple of different authors, and your, your story will be one of them. And I, thought it's, I, thought, I, thought, I just thought it was about self-publishing. But when the, when the article came out, there were three authors that were profiled, and I was the only one that was self-published. The first author had written 15 books. Her career, she's a career author. Um, she goes out there and she can make a salary and you know, do this as her job. And it talked about her marketing tactics and how she goes about it. The second author was, um, it was his first book as well, but he was published by a, a big publishing house and he'd already sold 15 or 20,000 books and um, you know, talked all about his strategies and his marketing tactics. And then the third author they profiled was me. 
And it talks about how I had sold a couple hundred books to friends and, friends and family and how I went about my marketing efforts and um, it talked about my book. You know, I played music around town and that kind of stuff. And it was just really cool to be included in an article like that. Um, and it, it's just another example of if you have an idea and you see it through, things like this just start to happen. And, and, and the last thing that I'll mention, which is really still cool to me, I'll say it again, it's being here today. I mean, being invited here by authors at Google to give this talk, I, I just never even dreamed something like this would happen. It, it's just really cool for me to be here talking to you about this. And it's, it's something that I, would, that, I would, that I would never imagine. So I'm thrilled to be here. Once again, it's an honor. And um, with, with that, that's, that's the majority of the content that I wanted to share. So I, if we have any extra time, I think I may open up for, for questions, if anyone has any. You talked about uh, selling your uh, book uh, through webcam. Um, how you managed to get around finding an agent who printed your book? Well, the webcam that I used was actually um, to give a talk to a class in, uh, in Wooster Academy. And it wasn't actually to, to sell the book. It was really just a one-on-one -on -one talk like this with the, with the class. But I, I've not yet figured out a way to use the webcam to, to sell the book. But I, believe me, I'll probably try. <laughs> you, you have a right market niche, though. Yeah. Exactly, I know. Well, it's one of the things I have learned is that um, you know, technology is because it's allowing everyone to do so many more things with their books than they, than they could imagine. I think you know, years ago, to get the book in someone's hands, you had to, um, you had, you had to be published. But now, you know, with the internet and with all the technology these days, I mean, there's e-books. My, my book's actually out on e-book. Um, I, I think I've sold a couple copies on e-book, which is cool. But, you know... That technology is developing, allowing people to have access to any book. Um, and the fact that, you know, this group I used, iUniverse, uh, they allowed me, even though I self-published, they allowed me to put the marketing into my hands, but they would take care of everything else. So they so, printed so they, the book for you? Sorry? So they printed the book They printed you. the book. They helped do cover design. They helped do interior design. They have, they have editing teams. Okay. They helped me edit the book and, and do the full kind of cover, copy, polish. And uh, once the book is done, they took care of everything. They take care of distribution. So it's on barnesandnoble.com. You can buy it on Barnes & Noble, or you can buy it on Amazon. And all I have to do is, is you know, market the book to friends and say, hey, if you want to get it, go check out Barnes & Noble. And they ship it to you directly, and I, and I take a cut, basically, of the fee. But um, you know, a long time ago, if you self-publish a book, you literally get boxes of books that show up uh, at your apartment. And if someone wants a book, you've got to go to FedEx and send it to them. So I've definitely seen improvements in technology that have allowed um, easier access for self-publishing, or people that self-publish to get their book in other people's hands. Thanks. Paul, Any other questions? can you hear me? Yes. So, like the voice of God. <laughs> Hi. Um, I was wondering, first off, thank you for coming. This is absolutely great. and glad I get to VC over in Mountain View. Um, two questions. One, you said you were in uh, California for a summer. And as a new Californian, uh, what was your favorite place in California? And then second, where is your favorite place all over the world? Ooh, that's a very tough question. Um, well, I'll answer your first question in two parts. Lake Tahoe itself, even though I was living there and I wasn't traveling, there's so many little small areas. And actually, I was surprised when I first moved out there because I thought Lake Tahoe was just a town or a place. But you learned that the lake, of course, is huge and there's tons of towns all around there. And I lived in Homewood, California, which is on the west side, kind of near North Tahoe. And so just exploring Tahoe itself was um, an amazing experience for me, especially that hike I mentioned was in the Desolation Wilderness, which is a uh, national forest that, you know, right behind Lake Tahoe. It's just a gorgeous place. So one, I love Lake Tahoe, but I'd say the area that I discovered most that um, was really unique to me was we drove up the coast from San Francisco all the way to about 30 miles south of the Oregon border to the Redwoods. And that is, a, believe me, that's a very magical place. Uh, we actually camped out on the Pacific coast, um, on the beach, woke up to the, to the ocean crashing, and then went and took some hikes in the redwoods that afternoon. And it's just, it's, it's unlike any other place I've ever been. So I think that's the, one of the coolest places I've been in California. And then one of the coolest places I've been in the world. You know, I, I mentioned this in the book. I said there's a place that I felt like I first discovered traveling. And it was when I was on a family trip when I was younger. I think I was in seventh grade. And it was our first trip to Europe. And the first place we went to, because it was, maybe because it was my first international experience, maybe it was because it was the first stop, but I, I've, I've traveled many other places before, and I still think this is the best 
one of the coolest places I've been. It's a town called Muren in Switzerland. And it's in the Lauterbrunnen Valley. And the, in Lauterbrunnen, one of the things I learned through this research, Lauterbrunnen means you know, like, like, a valley of waterfalls. And there are, there are 50 to 70 waterfalls coming down from cliffs. So you, you have this valley, this green pastures valley. And then you have these 500 meter cliffs surrounding the whole valley. And then above the cliffs, you have the Alps. And then on a, on a blue sky, you, you know, you've got the, the blue sky and the Alps and the cliffs and the waterfalls. And it, it's truly an amazing place. I actually wrote in the book that I feel like Murin, to me, is the town in the, in the story of the Grinch that stole Christmas. That's, that's, that's what it feels like. It's just this amazing little town in Switzerland. And uh, to me, that was one of the first places where I, my eyes opened up and I felt like I had found the new world. Okay, one more. Um, Okay, so what's next? So I've known Paul for a long time, and you're always doing something new. Do you see finance in your future, or do you see yourself taking more of a creative path, including travel long term? Or that's a good question. What do you have in your head? That's a very good question. I ask myself that quite (laughs) often. Um, To be honest, I'm not totally certain, but I think that there's a mix of both. I enjoy the finance, and I think I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing for now. I think it's great experience, and I learn a lot from it. I think. Uh, one of my goals in life is just to learn. And um, you know, one of the things in understanding finance and understanding how markets work, you've got to understand how the world works. And so that's, one, that's the reason why I appreciate it, because I'm, I'm constantly learning about why the world works. But I also have this creative side to me, and, and I, I want to continue um, my creative pursuits. In fact, it's a good question, because this morning, before I even came here, I had breakfast with someone uh, to talk about potentially recording some new, new music. I've recorded one album previously, but I'm thinking about recording some new music uh, perhaps in the new year, and it's very early stage, but I'm thinking about doing some additional music work, and I probably will write again. I think I realize that I love it, and I, I would love to write again, and I don't yet know what that topic's going to be. It, it, I may take a stab at, um, at fiction, or I may try to do nonfiction. You know, one, of the, one of the ideas I had recently um, was to write a book called What to Do in a Year, because I feel, and, and, and each section of the book would be a month, and I would highlight all the different things that are out there in the world to be done during that particular month. To give you an example, you know, take, um, take October. It'd be a great time to go to Germany, to go to Oktoberfest in October. But it's also a great time to go to a, a football game, and uh, the Georgia Florida football game. Um, so the, there's different places in different regions. I mean, take the summer, it's probably a great time to go surfing in California, but it's also a great time to go skiing in Chile. And so I thought about t- breaking out each month of the year and highlighting certain activities or certain... Um, you know, festivals or things that that, that that time of year is known for in capturing that. But that's just, that's just a thought. So I, I don't know what's next, but I'm very excited about what's next, and I'm sure uh, I'll have some ideas coming. Any more questions for Paul? Once again, thank you very much. Whitney, Chrissy, authors at Google, <laughs> very excited to be here. <laughs>